This is K-Pop Sunday brought to you by the K-Pop Sundays before you have to go back to work on Monday. We are your hosts, Old R. Min. And JR. Welcome to episode 40. Today, we're going quite some time back. This group might actually be older than some of our listeners. It is very close to my age, almost. At least that's where we start off. It's very close to when I was a wee little baby, so fun times. Today we will be starting off the quite interesting tale of Baby Vox. So let's go back to before the beginning, before the debut. What happened? What led up to this? In 1996, two major events happened that shaped the future group. In the UK, the Spice Girls debuted during the summer and revolutionized not just British pop, but also girl groups with the introduction of girl power. The other event occurred in Korea, and that was the success of the idol group H.O.T. following the release of their song Candy. The future group came to be nicknamed as the female H.O.T. in their early days because their concept was similar. Yoon Dung Ryong was the founder of Dung Ryong Planning and produced music for underground artists. But after seeing the Spice Girls and H.O.T., the company was reestablished as DR Music in 1997 and became the first company to put a girl group together based on the success of those two groups. This new group was going to be a much more vibrant girl group than Korea had seen in the past. The original lineup consisted of five members. Jung Hyun Jun was the leader and main vocalist. Kim Ee Zee was the main rapper and subvocal. Lee Hee Jin was the lead vocalist and face of the group. Cha Yu Mi was a vocalist, and Jung Shi Woon was the main rapper. The first person to be recruited for the group was Lee Gai, as she was already a trainee in the company. After Hyun Jin and Shi Woon were recruited, Hee Jin was street casted while walking home from school by the comedian Jung Soo Yoon and music managers from Dr. Music. The last member to join the group was Yumi. The girls trained for three years for their debut and the group concept changed during those years. At first, they were a trio and were going for a cute style. However, as mentioned earlier, the success of the Spice Girls and H.O.T. caused the group to add two more members and their concept to change to that of female warriors. They were supposed to be guardian deities for women and represent women. The choreography for this group was also different from what we typically think of for girl group choreography, as they were doing intense dancing like their male counterparts, H.O.T. and Jackies. However, before they could debut, Lee Guy had to withdraw from the group due to medical issues, so they needed to find one more member. The last member was Kim Hee Jung, who was streetcasted by the president of DR Music, and came to be known as Kim E.G. or Kim E.Z. <laughs> E.Z. Easy, whatever. As the vocals for the other four members were already recorded for their first album, Kim Easy's voice was not actually included. So at the official debut lineup was Hyun Jin, Kim Easy, Hye Jin, Yumi, and Si Woon. Together, they made up the future girl group Baby Voices of Expression, or Baby Box for short. They debuted on July 3rd, 1997 with the song To Men, Democracy. It was a social critique that encouraged girls to find their own path and their own voice. The song itself sounds strange because it was a mix of pop, hip-hop, spoken narration, and an aria-sounding vocal bit that easy lip-syncs in performances. The music video for it showed a strong image with the scenes of the girls in prison. There is a flash of a futuristic city followed by the girls in their own cells sitting around, although she does push-ups in hers. For reference, Hyunjun is the one who does narration and has her hair up. Shiwoon is the one with blonde streaks in her hair and is the tough rapper. Heejin is the cute one with pigtails. Yumi is the one with the killer voice. And Easy is the one with red streaks in her hair. There is also a scene of Heejin being chased and ganged up on by two guys. Behind them, the rest of the members, led by their leader Hyunjun, approach the three to defend their youngest member, and Shiwoon moves to the front to fight back when the guys pull out guns to shoot them. It was a very strong and unusual song to debut with, and could have been an anthem for later feminist movements, but it's mostly been forgotten. The reason for this is that it wasn't received well by the public. The song itself sounds really strange, which wouldn't have been too bad by itself, but as you'll remember, Jackie's School Anthem also sounded weird. However, it also wasn't what the public expected from a girl group. While boy groups doing hip-hop wasn't anything new by 1997, girls releasing similar music with strong messaging wasn't really a thing, let alone something the public thought positively of. 
So, unfortunately, a few days after release, the song was banned from three broadcasts. In response to their debut song being banned, their title track was changed a few days later to their follow-up track, Haircut, which is also known as The Day I Got My Hair. Haircut is about a relationship going south and the girl cutting her hair short because the guy loved her long hair. Her hair becomes something more of her than just something to please her ex. This is also a theme that you see in a lot of other groups' music videos because hair is not only hair. It has a lot of meanings in many, many cultures, but that is a topic for another day. The song is a mix of hip-hop and pop and doesn't sound nearly as strange as two men did. The music video for Haircut opens with Siwon being slapped by actor Kim Youngmin and flashes between clips of the girls singing and dancing. Most of the music video takes place at the Dreamland theme park, which was an amusement park in Seoul, built in 1987, that went under the same year as this music video was filmed, and was eventually demolished and built over. It was also a mess. Fits with the storyline we're going to tell you, but just mess. Honestly, the video is kind of a mess too. It's so hard to watch with all the flashing happening. And like the camera shakes, I think they added the camera shakes after the fact, but I was just like, my head hurts. <laughs> the song's good though. <laughs> this quote unquote new debut track was found to be more acceptable to the public. And on July 10th, Baby Vox's debut album, Equalizer, was dropped. It had a pop art style cover of the members and had nine tracks, including the two debut songs. Aside from To Men, Democracy, and Haircut, there's two b-sides we want to mention. The first one is Waiting, which is a serene pop song that was in English. The other track is Single Mother because it is a sorrowful song with vocals that are full of emotion. The album sold about 50,000 copies and reached number 47 on the music show SBS Gaio Top 20. However, a few months after their debut, they had their first lineup change. Yumi was burnt out from the life of an idol in addition to the 7-8 to eight hours of practice a day. The cartilage in her knee was being damaged from all the dancing, and at her family's strong urging for her to rest and come back home, she departed from the group and returned to the US. Luckily, that wasn't the end of her work in the music industry. She is now a singer-songwriter and goes by the name Lola Fair. Among the songs she's worked on, she wrote the English version of Boa's Girls on Top. She wasn't the only member to leave either. Hyunjin and Shiwoon left after Yumi did. Hyunjin went on to take acting classes, work as a yoga instructor, and she currently runs a restaurant in Busan. Shiwoon went on to open a dance academy in New Zealand called Shiwoon Jong Dance Academy. Less than a year after they were introduced to the public, Baby Vox had a bad debut and lost over half of their members. Over time, their original lineup, debut song, and debut album would mostly be forgotten. But that wasn't where the group ended. With three members gone, including their leader, the group needed new members for their next album. And just a remake in general. At this point, Kim Easy and Heejin were the only founding members left, so Kim Easy took over the role of leader. The addition who took Yumi's role as main vocalist was new member Kan Myon. She was recruited by a manager who saw her during a baby box performance that was being filmed at a theme park. When it was found that she was good at singing, she was added to the group before Hyunjun and Shiyun's departures. The next member to join was Shim Eun-jin, who became a sub-vocalist. She was originally supposed to debut in another group from a different agency, but after those plans fell through, she ended up with baby box. The final member to join the new lineup was Yi Gai. That's right, the member who almost debuted in the original lineup was back and finally getting her time to shine. However, the member lineup wasn't the only change fans would see, as Baby Vox would also be changing their group concept as well. Considering that their hip-hop female warrior concept didn't go over well with the public, and girl groups like SM Entertainment's SES had successful debuts, this caused Baby Vox to go with a cute concept instead. As this was their original concept pre-debut, it seemed to be a good fit. Baby Fox released their new song, Ya Ya Ya, on September 15th, 1998. It is a very poppy track, and the lyrics are about being in love. The music video matches this with the white outfits and the dresses in pearl pink, which is their group color. The girls have a very cute and youthful image to match it. Even the term Baby Angels, which is the name for their fans, fits the vibe. I want to mention real quick, this might be 
their most covered yep. song. When I was looking at videos for this song specifically, I saw that Twice has covered it, Cosmic Girls Chocomi has covered it, Urban Zakapa has covered it. I mean, I don't know how many others have. The public reacted positively to this concept change, but the group toned it down a bit for their follow-up track, Change. It's a high-energy pop song with lyrics about a girl realizing she's changed from how she used to be. She likes guys paying attention to her and dressing up, but later comes to realize that putting on makeup and the likes of it just isn't as fun as it used to be. The music video is very colorful and the choreography is very fast in some sections. These two songs were on their second album, Baby Vox 2. K-pop naming conventions. Not strange this time, just boring. The cover image has a pearl pink color scheme and features the member looking absolutely stunning. There were eight songs in total on this album, including Waiting from the previous album. However, they also had tracks like Break It Up, which was very upbeat, and a cover of the Carpenters hit song Top of the World that the members learned to play instruments for, and a remix of Ya 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 that was a version from television and used in the music video for Ya Ya Ya. The album sold over 200,000 copies and reached number 3 on Inkigayo. They won quite a few awards, but the most important ones were the popularity awards at the Soul Music Awards because it was their first major prize. This album also came to be thought of as their first album instead of Equalizer. And even today you'll find some places that say that it is. It's funny because it says two in the album Yeah, well name. also some websites get wrong that the name of Equalizer. They don't say it's that because it's Equalize mm. Her. And so it's kind of like dismissing that. But yeah, a lot of places yeah. will either say Equalize Her or Baby Vox 1, which that's not the album title either. However, the group had a massive scandal amidst the success. Igai was supposed to be 20, but it turned out she was 30, and her real name was actually Yi Hee Jung. Not only that, but she had been a singer since 1988 and debuted multiple times before. Her first attempt was Seitore, and when they disbanded in 1989, she wound up in a duo called Tam Tam in 1991. She even had a solo debut before Baby Vox in 1993, but Baby Vox was her last attempt to succeed in the music industry. I love that so much. And also, here's the thing that's kind of crazy. Setore, they were performing with So Bong Cha. That, wow, really? Yes, that was the weirdest thing to me. There's a couple of cute performances where they're both on stage together, and there's one where like they sort of pretend that they're getting married, and it's really wholesome, which is <laughs> so cute. You should ship it. But <laughs> seeing them, though, with Sobang Cha, because when I think of, like, old Korean pop, like, I think of Sobang Cha. So seeing them on stage with them, it's like, whoa, <laughs> that, that makes more sense. She was also on TV a lot. The fact that nobody picked up on this. That's the thing. That's why I was like, she is the ultimate scammer. No, I don't think that it was just her. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not blaming her or anything. She released two albums with DR Music. Which is yeah, exactly before Baby Vox. So it's like they so knew that's what like, was like, happening. Mm. They knew. Yeah. Yeah. She was found out when a fan started getting suspicious. There were a couple of things that seemed off about her, including the fact that she wore sunglasses or hats when none of the other members did. But she was also criticized for not being able to keep up with the choreography, which you can see especially with change. This fan's theory was spread and eventually confirmed. Igai left the group and was replaced by Yoon Unhai who ended up being the youngest member and the last to join. While researching this, there was a discussion on her Namu wiki about why her lying about her age was so bad. Aside from the lying and the industry thinking 30 is old, it's also that Baby Vox's concept was very youthful. If she hadn't lied and the group had gone off a more neutral or mature image, it's possible that things would have gone a bit better. And as a reminder, she released her solo work previously at this company. So it's unlikely that nobody knew what was going on. However, Baby Wax didn't return to the young, cute image of Ya Ya Ya. Instead, they went with a more mature concept for their next comeback. In fact, the first track intro even emphasizes this when it says it's time to change and move on Baby Wax. This new Baby Wax was different from the past. And the title track for this album was the start of this new chapter of the group. The title track of their new album was Get Up. 
which was a pop track with lyrics about a girl telling a guy to get up and take her hand already. But it is also strongly implied that she wanted something more. It was on the sexier side, but their stage outfits were rather sporty. The music video for this was focused on the members and their dancing. Also, I feel like if you have a group of friends, their black outfits are a really easy Halloween costume. We're going to be past yeah. Halloween by the time this comes out, but for next year, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> they ranked number one for the first time on KBS Music Bank on August 8th, and other awards soon followed. The next song they released didn't have a music video, but was promoted on music shows and is memorable nonetheless. Killer is a pop track about a girl trying to forget her ex. It was produced by Kim Hyunsuk, who also worked with the group on the fourth and fifth albums. The styling for this promotion was early Y2K or 90s futurism, and they looked great. The final track that Baby Vox promoted from this album was a ballad called Missing You. The lyrics are about breaking up and parting from someone, and the emotions that come with it. The music video is pretty somber and opens up with a boy in a basket in the water and the members being sad. The next clip shows the girls reading a letter from a sick boy. They go to visit him with gifts and try to cheer him up. And then it cuts to them dancing in a really aesthetic room that is dark blue with lights on the back wall and the floor has about an inch of water. The reflection of the blue water fits the sad tone of this moment and is contrasted with the girls dressed in white outfits. Finally, it closes with the image of the same boy at the beginning and implies that he died and the girls are sad about his passing. These tracks are all from their third album, Come Come Baby, which was released on July 21st, 1999 and had 12 songs in all. It sold over 200,000 copies and resulted in the group winning many awards. These honors include a bonsang at the Seoul Music Awards. Due to their success, they starred in their first CFs, or commercials. This was also the year when they began going overseas and were aiming to promote in China. While 1999 should have been their year, a rumor resulted in Baby Vox and Dr. Music being hit by anti-fans. Someone had made up a rumor that Neon was dating Moon Hee Joon of H.O.T. And you gotta remember, this was back in 99, so technology was not what it is today. But there weren't any proof of this. Like, no pictures, no statements, no nothing. But that didn't stop fans of the boy group from attacking the girl group. There were death threats, members who were still in school were bullied, and audiences for their performances were either silent or chanting anti-fan slogans, among other things like inflicting physical harm to the group. And this went on even after the disbandment of H.O.T. in 2001. There's a reason why they're one of the most violent fandoms in K-pop history. But 99 was just the prelude for what Baby Vox would do in 2000. Baby Vox released their fourth album, Why, on May 15th. It built off their previous album by showing a mature and sophisticated side to the group. The album cover shows the members in office casual attire with white shirts and black pants or skirts. The album had 12 songs and the girls promoted three of them. The title track for the album was Why, a slow pop song with lyrics about a girl having the sense that her guy has someone else in his heart. She's asking why he's acting this way and when will he be honest with her. The music video stands out for its visuals. It was filmed in Guilin, China, and featured many iconic spots in the area, including the reed flute cave. The girls' outfits also stand out, as they are dressed in colorful long skirts and gorgeous tops. If you look at their live shows, you'll notice that their alternative outfits stand out as well. The follow-up track they promoted was Betrayal, which was about telling a guy she's had enough and is done with him. It's got an edge to it, which matches perfectly with the futurism styling of the music video and outfits. The final song on this album that we'll be talking about is Patron. And if you listen to the whole album, just straight up, this fierce pop song sounds very out of place. And that's actually because it was the Korean theme song for an animated film called Gundress. The movie was a joint venture between Korea and Japan, released in the previous year, and has a chaotic <laughs> legacy. And so was added to the album, which kind of disrupts the flow of the entire album going up to that point. But it is convenient for fans to like the song. So their album Y sold over 150,000 copies in Korea and ranked pretty well on the charts. 
Aside from their fourth album, the group was also very busy in 2000. The group promoted in China and Japan and gained quite a devoted fan base. In September, they were part of the Korean Wave mini concert in New York and LA. In October, they had a mini concert for a thousand fans in Japan, and in November, they were the first Korean girl group to do a concert in Beijing. They were in commercials for Lottie Ice Cream, LG, and even an online shopping mall. To finish the year, they won several awards, including the Popularity Award at the Seoul Music Awards, which they deserve because (laughs) why, in my personal opinion, is their best album. Baby Box was spreading in popularity and interest, and fans were eager to see what they would do in 2001. On June 4th, 2001, Baby Vox returned with their fifth album, Boyish Story. It had 16 tracks, and this album was a bit special because for the first time, songs written by the members were included. The album cover is in black and white and features the members lounging in chairs while wearing quote-unquote boyish clothes. The album starts with Eunjin narrating a story of walking down a road while feeling lonely, then finding someone that doesn't make her feel lonely anymore. From there, the album goes back and forth between being in love and falling out of love. The title track for this album is called Game Over. It's a pop song with lyrics about acknowledging the love has died in a relationship and saying goodbye, even though the other party is still holding on. The music video for Game Over shows two guys who feel regret when they see a picture of their ex. One guy tries to call and the other wanders around with a gun. Meanwhile, EZ drives off in a convertible away from both of them. Someone gonna get murdered? What on earth? I don't know. It doesn't resolve. It is definitely one of the weirdest music video storylines. Okay. Like, I could not figure it out. Anyway, the follow up track was Doll. It's a pop song about leaving after being treated like the person was just some kind of doll. It starts with a music box melody and then transitions into the pop instrumental. The music video is beautifully stylized to emphasize the doll aspect with the members' costumes, hair, and makeup done to resemble dolls. And it was an understandably hit song. The story of the album ends with happily being in the arms of a significant other. While the album told a story about the highs and lows of being in love, it wasn't as successful as their previous releases. It only sold about 90,000 copies and reached fourth place on the KBS Music Bank charts. However, the group was still very busy that year, so here are some highlights. Right before Boyish Story was released, they held a guerrilla concert that over 9,000 people attended. For those of you who don't know what a guerrilla concert is, it's different from a regular concert in that it's planned much closer to the day of the concert and isn't announced with much warning, sometimes even within the day itself. So to get thousands of people to show up with little notice is a pretty impressive feat. Then, from July to December, the group did a tour in China, and during this tour, the Baby Vox Computer School was established in Beijing on November 27th. So even though Boyish Story wasn't the hit they had been expecting, the group still walked away from 2001 with more fans and experience. In the span of four years, Baby Vox went from being female warriors to Hallyu stars. They were able to stand apart from the groups they had originally been inspired by, groups that by this time weren't active, as Spice Girls had gone on hiatus the previous year, and by May of 2001, H.O.T. had disbanded. But this is just part one of the group's history. We will be covering what happened after 2001 in the next episode. So let's move on to the song of the day. November 7th, all the way back in 2012, one of my favorite songs from 2012 was released. It is Love Me by D-Unit. This was the group's second single, their very first like comeback after debut earlier in the year. And D-Unit was a three-member girl group who was very inspired by 21, but it was 2012 and a lot of groups were doing more edgy stylings, and it was fun. Things about this music video still bug me to this day. There's one point in the dance part where one of the members just suddenly swaps places, because I think there was a kind of obvious favorite member in the producer's eyes. But it's a fun song. I love album descriptions from smaller groups because in the albums they always hype up their groups so much. Like in the Love Me album description it says, D Unit who debuted splendidly with the first album, Welcome to Business last summer. And it's like their debut was okay. Love Me was actually, was either written or 
co-written or produced by a dude who did a lot of Rain's music. But is it anything that stands out? Very much no. But it's still a good song. I kind of love this vibe because they tried to do a quote-unquote rock and mix it with hip-hop even though it's not rock at any point except some kind of weird faux leather and tattoos mixed into a pop song and like three people trying to be edgy in a hip-hop way but with a alternative styling to it. It's weird. The autotune on this song is weird but I still really like it and I listened to Love Me quite a lot and I could never do the dance because my brain just couldn't. <laughs> You should go listen to it if you're not already full of Baby Box music now. The unit, love me, great. Today's trivia question is: Baby Vox's fan color is pearl pink, but do you know what other group that also debuted in 1997 had pink as their fan color as well? If you do, let us know. If you don't, you'll hear the answer in the next episode. Ooh. Do y'all know who it is? It's not who you think it is. Isn't it? It's this? not SES. What? So it's not SES? I was pretty sure it was No, SES. it's not SES. No. That's who I know people think it was originally. When I found out it was this group, I was shocked. I was like, I thought this group's color what might have been like orange or yellow or brown. Because like those are the main colors I've usually seen them with. But this group debuted with pink and I'm like, the only reference I recall of them being pink was one of their debut outfits was in pink, but finding out that's like their official color was just very shocking to me. So I guarantee you it's going to be a shock to the audience as well if they don't know who it is. Anyways, let's get out of here. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, then please make sure to rate, subscribe, follow, and tell your friends about us. If you want to interact with us or just see more of our content, then you can follow us on Twitter at kpopsumbays or on our other social media platforms, which will be in the description. Also, don't forget that our next episode comes out on November 14th. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Annyeong.